Good friend, the distinguished member of the legal fraternity, Mr. Patan. A very distinguished academician in his own right, Mr. Murali Karun. We have in our midst the members of late Justice Sina Paradigal. I am a very distinguished and eminent personality city member of the midst today. A very distinguished uh, writer. And uh, what should I say? A name known to one and all. We came out to the Friends, ladies. At the very outset, you are able to hear me. My is okay. It is this. My deepest sense of honor on being asked to deliver this justice of Chinnabarity Memorial Lecture on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of this part. This privilege. I will personally take as being more an account of the fact that I also happen to serve this country as a judge of the Supreme Court of India. That in no way can ever mean that I'm even remotely worthy as the great man in whose memory this lecture is being given. I did not, I wish, to impute a mistake. In my widest dreams, ever imagined that I would hold the same position that he did in comparison to the accomplishments of Justice Chinabaradi, both before and after his appointment as a judge of the Supreme Court. Let me emphatically state that my occupation of the same position has to be deep in my mind a simple twist of fate. Well, I could not have avoided accepting this invitation from the legal fraternity that is the Indian Association of People's Lawyers. I must confess to a great deal of trepidation. And how could I not feel defeated? After all, I am taking up, talking about a person who was my hero in the judicial parliament as he indeed was for so many of us who began our study of law, as he rose to prominence by the dint of his intellectual brilliance and his unparalleled capacity to fuse that with empathy for the weakest of us. Let me place it on record that one of the reasons I joined the law college was the Justice Jinnabaradi in my early years as a member of the bar, the talk of seniors in the profession of our justice in our lady was of unalloyed appreciation. We followed his judgments vividly, avidly, and many an afternoon spent in the courts, he presided over for unforgettable lessons in graceful deportment, incredible legal and sociological insights, and above all, a palpable concern for justice with a solicitous concern for the weakest as its primordial and particular part. A special mention must, of course, be made 
of contribution of Justin Chinnabha when he is a judge of the ABA court. As many of you may be aware, in the dark days of emergency, even as the judiciary of ethics court buckled and delivered the constitutional homage that was Lady and Jabadu, a few justices, indeed a mere handful across the country, insisted that emergency powers could not be interrupted to mean the abandonment of core fundamental rights. What are we all just now speaking about? Justice Chinnabaliti was one of the leading lights in the beacon of hope. When political and constitutional darkness then we up the polity, in these present times, I would suggest that Justice Chinnabaliti is tenure as a judge of the then United AP High Court should be taken as an example and guide for those serving on the High Court who might be tempted to cop down to the executive, setting aside their moral burden of reality to the highest values of an independent division, the Constitution and the Court of Justice. As a member of then younger, younger cohort of the bar, I can attest the fact that Chinnabaliti's unwavering protection of political freedom and Indian democracy electrified us and infused us with a great sense of idealism and engendered an understanding that there is a larger purpose to practice of law. At the same time, we were also very dismayed when the regime considered him to be defiant and difficult as he was transferred to another high court. When the emergency period ended, Justice Chinnabaliti was offered the position of Chief Justice of the AP High Court indicating an institutional appointment. He declined and chose to stay back at the High Court he was transferred to. The reason? Because Justice Chinnabaliti was also committed to the idea of protection of the dignity of the court and his moral framework would not allow something as trivial in his mind as personal indication to hint a mistake by the institution. What one of the leading jurists of India wrote about him is what a recounting here. Chinnabaliti occupies a secure and exalted place in the Indian judicial pantheon. The judicial virtues he pursued on the high court, high bench, helped enormously to restore the bruised legitimacy of the Supreme Court of India. The notion of avatar never appealed to him. For Chinapa, the virtue of rectitude assumed the concern of collegiality. He strove to enhance the collective competence of the court as an institution of co-governance of the nation and contributed greatly to the sustenance of its collective constitutional system. Unquote. I believe that Justice Chinnabarad is concerned about enhancement of collective competence of court is best exemplified by his discussion of the celebrated Minerva in this case, in Sanjeev Court's case. The principal question for consideration was whether the Court in Coal Mines Act 1972 was entitled to the protection of Article 31C of the Constitution. In other arguments, Nechi, AKCN, had relied on certain sweeping observations of Justice Bhagwati, which effectively held the connection has to be between the law and the directive principles, and it must be a real and a substantial connection. She Sain had creatively used the prolix language of this Bhagavati in Minerva means. To submit law founded and discrimination is not entitled to the protection of Article 31C. As such, law can never be said to be the part of the directive principles. An article that a very clear and uh, intricate uh, argument. How Justice Chinnabaliti 
against the rather creative manner in which Sri Sain had sought to subvert the main principles of Minerva ought to be taken as an essential lesson for religious writing on constitutional values that seemingly contradicted each other. It's worth citing from the judgment at length. I do, I do so with the name of the friends sitting in the audience. We have some misgivings about the Minerva means. Despite its rare beauty and a persuasive rhetoric, we confess the case has left us perplexed. In the second place, the question of constitutional validity of 31 C appears to us to be concluded by the decision of the court in case one. The protection of 31 C was at the time confined to laws giving effect to the policy of class B and C of Article 39. Justice China already then brilliantly analyzed the dialectics of the constitutional structure to setting aside Mr. Sain's assertion as to what Minerva means to I quote, we, while we are broadly agree much that has been said by Bhagavati Ji to accept the submission of Mr. Sain, that the law of bounded and discrimination is not entitled to the protection of Article 31 C as such, a law can never be sold, set to further the directive principles affirmed in Article 39 B would indeed be to use a hackery phrase to put the cart before the horse. If the law made to further the directive principles is necessarily non discriminatory, or is based on a reasonable classification, then such a law does not need any protection, such as that afforded by Article 31 C. Such a law would be valid on its own strength with no aid from 31 C. To make it a condition precedent that a law seeking the heaven of Article 31 C must be non discriminatory or based on reasonable classification is to make. Article 31C means. Unquote. Possibly realizing the very prolixity of the language of Justice Bhagavati that made in economics a case of rare beauty was also leading to avenues for this interpretation. And subverting the very principle of the Constitution tough, sought to strike a balance, the legislation for achievement of progressive goals would not be set aside on the annual of a simplistic and limited reading of egalitarianism. Justice China Paradi rehabilitated both Minerva in the gentlest of and yet effective terms, besides Justice Bhagavad. And then he continued, while we agree with Bhagavad Gita that the connection with the directive principles must not be some remote or tenuous connection, we deliberately refrain from the use of the words real and substantive, dominant, basically and essentially necessary, and closely and integrally connected, lest anyone chase after the meaning of these expressions. And that we have now said about the qualifying words is only to caution ourselves against adjectives getting the better of the now. If, if one can read that sentence. And right in the presence of Justice Bhagavati, who is a member in the Senate, and he agreed, he just, he just signed it. And while talking about Minerva, while saying, uh, appreciating that it's a rare beauty, Justice Chakravarti says, only he can say that, nobody else. Therefore, I was uh, struggling to prepare this lecture with a lot of in, uh, input from research as we said. Still, I think I complete the delivery, I still feel nervous about it. Perhaps this lecture, which has saved so many pages, just to chin up already, could I have perhaps spoken about it. The entire substance 
in direct access. About the qualifying words, we don't need to caution ourselves against adjectives getting better of the noun. Adjectives are attractive. Forensic aids, but in my case of interpretation, they are diverting intruders. <laughs> and this is Bhagavati is sitting with we live in Sanji. And we're finishing the lesson on the need to be careful of what one writes and not let eloquence get the better of the need to be very careful in uttering more than what is necessary. The master of test formulation ended with a gentle arm over the shoulder of his fellow judge. I quote, these observations are full conference of Bhagavati justice. After having said that, he concluded in Sanjeev, these observations are full conference of Bhagavati justice. Unquote. Notwithstanding such mastery, over constitutional imperatives and deep and abiding concern for judicial safeguards. Justice Lady was allowed to write for the majority. I have carefully chosen that word allowed to write. Only in few five judge constitution benches. This is often thought of as a big mystery and in a hush to whisper suggested ought to be unraveled. Especially given that scholars like uh, Gabboys and Bakshi have opined that Justice Chinnabaradi must surely rank as one of the few towering intellects who have raised the Supreme Court. You also are... It is difficult to find another equation. One does not have to posit or subscribe to a theory that the judges of the Supreme Court overly discriminate against fellow judges on the basis of their social background to begin to drawing apart the tie strings of this mystery, given that the majority of the judges of the Supreme Court have come from social backgrounds in which lyricism of the written text is a paramount value, the emphasis placed by his generality hailing from hot scrabble phase and social background on moral urgencies of the consequences for the weakest may have been less palatable. Moreover, for those hailing from social backgrounds in which equivocation of reality of the social condition of the masses was an inherent cultural imperative, the testiness of his articulation may have engendered the uncomfortable level of cognitive dissonance. Whatever the force that may have conspired or conjugated to prevent a brilliant humanist from setting the parameters of modes of constitutional adjudication, contents and the contours of constitutional identity, and inscribing the framework of discourse that is always mindful of moral agency in effort to achieve a more progressive and socially just state of affairs without allowing the state to turn authoritarian and fascist, we necessarily have to wonder whether the predicament that our democracy finds itself in many, in may also be an account of an under-theorized, under-cooked progressive liberalism making it shallow. Notwithstanding the eloquent exigence of egalitarianism and social justice, by favored mandarins, this was put on show. Less emphasis was placed on the material consequences. For the less fortunate, and how that might impact the ability of the masses to understand and to protect the project of democracy, project of democracy in India. If only Justice Chinnapuriti had been allowed to clearly articulate 
the main contours of constitutional identity and the moral urgency that he felt animated the Indian constitution has been allowed to be the central focus. Maybe we would have had the benefit of a more brilliantly and persuasively articulated as well as a lasting constitutional jurisprudence. Some things that have cautioned us that unless a nation heeds and acts upon the moral urgency of establishing conditions of social justice in which the inherent dignity of the vicar to deprive the masses is a reasserted and protected political equality will be of a mere particular value and potentially unprotected from depredations by the elite classes. This would be because those very masses, due to their continued material and cultural deprivations, relative and absolute, would be left with limited social capacities, individually and as groups, to defend the substantive aspects of even political freedoms. <coughs> this was the fear that Baba Sahib pointed out so pleasantly when our constitution was ratified. I refer to his uh, last two lectures in the Continuing of vast and graded social economic inequalities, with just a notional equality in the political sphere, may be argued as having created the current crisis of our democracy, marked by a strident and evil discourse against the political freedoms of those who seek to speak for the weakest. Normally, in speeches such as this, the speaker would move towards a rendering of issues of more current purpose and may refer to the person being honored only parenthetically. But Jesse Chinnaparati was no ordinary great man. It would be an unpardonable mistake intellectually to not recount the many warning bells he had sounded, most of which we as a nation did not fully heed and inevitably wound our way to our current predicaments. Of course, in a long and distinguished career as a JLT, as a general, he delivered many hundreds of interviews of exit logic, redolent to certificate and deep clarity. Hence, the very process of choosing a few to talk about it will necessarily begin to be a bit arbitrary. However, the following few cases that I wish to highlight are those in which have deeply influenced me, and as I sketch them, I am hoping that the audience will pick up the deep strains of constitutional angst. We must all feel the current status of constitutional jurisprudence in India. The first case I wish to describe is Muhammad Yusuf Ratha. In this particular case, the man, main issue was about the how irrelevant grounds in an order of primitive detention vitiated. Justice Singhal authored the majority opinion for himself and Justice Akaria. Justice Chinnapareti was flabbergasted, I quote, by his words, by a good deal of vehement argument advanced by Dr. Singh to sustain the order of his detention, unquote. And he chose to add a brief note with his comments. He began with a characteristically brilliant formulation that encapsulates the constitutional anxieties and constitutional checks. I never knew that in a concurring judgment, such a position could be taken. Concurring only the result. As always, it is what citing him a little extensive. The Constitution of India, I quote, Recognize this preventive this detention as a necessary evil. Follow the next sentence. 
but nonetheless can be used. Got the point, I suppose. Nonetheless, evil. So we have a constitution mandate circumscribed by the making of two rights in the Article 22 point. To be informed as soon as we do. Two, to be afforded the obvious opportunity of making a representation. The inclusion of an irrelevant non existing ground among the relevant grounds is an infringement of first of the rights, and inclusion of an obscure or vague ground among other clear and definite grounds is an infringement of the second. In either case, there is an invasion of constitutional rights of the detainee, entitling him to approach the court for relief. The reason for saying that inclusion of even a single irrelevant or obscure ground is an invasion of the detainee's constitutional right, is that the court is precluded from adjudicating upon sufficiency of the rights. Unquote. With regard to Dr. Singhvi's argument, not to the present Dr. Singhvi's father, that all other perpetrated charges that are vague and incoherent should be disregarded and only the last one be taken into account. The following observation of Dr. Chinnamarendi was so characteristic of the great man's capacity for the brilliant metaphor that is both precise and also compelling. I quote, the last straw which breaks a camel's back does not make weightless the other loads on the camel's back. Unquote. Only he could have said it. The whole philosophy is stated in one test sentence. As I reread the case, I read it a number of times. As a lawyer, as a judge, as a CJC, as a judge of the Supreme Court. I have a compilation of the judgment by my side for getting educated. And the that habit continues to happen. As I read in the case of Mohammed Yusuf, in preparation of this lecture, I smiled uh, rightly to myself. Just a few days ago, for the breath, in the newspapers, that the Union of India declared in the Supreme Court that jail is the only place for armaments. In the newspaper reports, there was no indication that the Supreme Court asked about the meaning of that expression. Nobody asked it. What do you mean by that? Anyone following the current social political discourse, even with a modicum of effort, would probably be aware that the expression is not used for anyone and all who wants any kind of support for the weaker segments are engaged in criticism of authorities or of a particular social political stance. In Mohammed Yusuf, one of the first terms cited was the detainee was an excellent, a, a little bit my own analysis which on closer examination only involved the detainee believing that he meant no more than that he was a believer in the Marxist Leninist ideology. And Dr. Singhvi confessed that the expression Naxalite was too imprecise and vague. The other ground pressed for detention was that the detainee made a speech in which he asked the audience and shunned the life of dishonor and in rise against the revolt against the repression. As he always did, just with Chinaparadi's observation, convey the correct constitutional position, which we all can then compare with what we see and hear today. Now I quote this Chinaparadi. Some think it was not a lecture, it was a part of the judgment. Some think of naturalites as bloodthirsty monsters. Some compare them to Jonah Bar. 
It all depends on the class to which one belongs. It's over now. <laughs> Once political views and ideological perceptions I omitted the portion there. Dr. Singh, we are continuing the point. Had ultimately to confess that the expression was as definite or vague as words describing ideologies. I continue. It is enough to say that it is just a label which can be as misleading as any other and is perhaps used occasionally for that very purpose. What is the purpose? The other sentence is to mislead. And if the expression is used only to mislead. Now expression like revolt and revolution are flung about by all and sundry. Every turn against the establishment is called a revolt. And every new idea is labeled as a revolution. Neither paragraph 3 nor 4 of the grounds of detention specifies the particular form of revolt or revolution which is a detaining advocate. Did he incite the people to violence? Next question. What words did he employ? What then is the connection between these grounds and acting in a manner of division to the maintenance of public order? There is no answer to be cleaned. And hence, the alleged grounds are held to be both that's how we watch it. Unquote. Unless some misguided souls engage in new Nietzsche criticism of the foregoing and the response of a judge who was a socialist. We can reassure them that this is deliberately's defense of political freedoms, of conscience, of ideological persuasions, and of expression was equally felicitously extended to those who could be deemed to hold entirely opposing social political opinions, such as those who have not read the Ramashankar, revolution. The Supreme Court was dealing with the legality of termination for the government job on the grounds that the apparent Ramashankar revolution had taken part in RSS and Jamsa. Yusuf was, allegation was Nasser, and the allegation against Ramashankar was that he was RSS. And I must again repeat, as always, citing this, which never will be exclusive, is worthwhile. This is instructive for all of us. How certain things we utter in public discourse, in where we become counterpart. Look what he says. India is not a police state. Over. India is a democratic republic. Just two sentences. I quote. More than 30 years ago, on January 26, 1950, the people of India resolved to constitute India as a democratic republic and to secure to all its citizens the right of thought, especially in the This determination of the people, let us hope, is not a forgotten chapter of history. These are the situations. All that is said is that before, he was absorbed in government service. He had taken part in some RSS Jameson activities. What those activities were has never been disclosed. Same yardstick which he applied in his is being applied. That's what this was. All that is said is before he was absorbed in the government service, he had taken part in some RSS at Jensen activities. What those activities were has never been disclosed. Neither the RSS nor the Jensen is alleged to be engaged in any subversive or other illegal activity, nor are the organization banned. 
most people are they are consistent. Including intellectuals who may not agree with the programs and philosophy of the Janasana and the Arasa, perhaps he was speaking for himself. Or for that matter, yeah, of course he was speaking for himself, so of course for, perhaps he was speaking for himself. For that matter, of many other political parties and organizations and all people are different people. But that's Everyone is entitled to his thoughts and views. Look at the discussion in this course. There are no barriers. What then was the sin that the respondent committed in participating in some political activity before his absorption in the government service? He poses the question. The whole idea of seeking a police report on the political faith and the past political activity of a candidate for public employment appears to our mind to cut at the very root of the fundamental rights of equality of opportunity in the matters of employment, freedom of expression, and the freedom of person. You people don't pick up this idea and silently suffer Subject your clients who are appearing for the civil services and the about to join the law. ID inquiries, special branch inquiries. Why, why this judgment cannot be pressed into service? The very idea of your verification of ID services. Unless you are verifying about the criminal acts, was he arrested? Was he involved in the criminal acts? Is it this very clear? Where is the question of your very point to which organization belongs? What ideology he cherishes? I have not heard anything after this on this issue. The whole idea of seeking a police report, so much I have really. Rights of equality in the matter of employment, freedom of expression, and freedom of justice. All the fundamental rights 